Come in, everybody, take a seat. Um, welcome to another um, session of the Ideas Festival. Um, hopefully this is not your first. Uh, there's been some great topics today, last night, and there's cer certainly a lot more to come um, through to this evening and into tomorrow as well. So stick around and get to as many sessions as you can. Um, in this session, we're talking about love and other avatars. Um, so we're here with Associate Professor uh, Michael Blumenstein, who's head of school for ICT at Griffith University. And Michael, the last time uh, you and I were together, we were talking about a range of things from machine learning, neural networks, and very long-term sustainability of information. And I'm very pleased to say for you guys that we're not talking about that today. Uh, we're talking about love and other avatars. Can you find real happiness in virtual worlds? Um, and as someone whose avatar is still standing in the corner of the disco uh, in Second Life, with very few friends and nervously tapping his foot, I'm very keen to find out what Michael has to say. So for the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to hand over to Michael, and then we're going to have some questions. Thank you. Can you join me in welcoming Michael to the stage? Thank you, Rory. Uh, thank you for the welcome. Um, as Rory's pointed out, my name is Michael Blumenstein, and um, I have a, a very strong interest in um, information and communication technology. And of course, um, there's so many facets to that area. And of course, one of those areas is, um, is the aspect of virtual worlds, avatars, and artificial intelligence. And I, and I hope to be able to convey some things to you that might be of interest in those areas. So to give you a bit of a, an overview of the presentation today, um, I'll be speaking about uh, computing at the very beginning and, and sort of setting the scene um, for where we are at now with the concept of uh, virtual worlds, avatars, and everything in between. Um, we'll, you'll hear about what a cyber twin is. I'll talk to a little bit about or give an introduction to artificial intelligence and where that actually uh, sits as uh, pretty much the driver and most important part of the future uh, of uh, virtual worlds and, and uh, social networking and uh, avatar usage. I'll then give you some examples of, of some specific areas in artificial intelligence that may or may not cause happiness um, in our lives, but potentially may cause distress, depending on your uh, particular area of interest. Uh, but certainly, I, I hope today to convince you that uh, without where we are at with the technological advances that have occurred over the past, well, probably about 50 or 60 years, that uh, we, we are actually now in a, in a phase of, of the generations where happiness is certainly being contributed to through technological advances and how important some of those advances are for our future. So I will talk, I will conclude on that note and uh, hopefully you'll make your own uh, minds up and uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll be welcoming questions at that time. So um, one of the things I, I will also be trying to convince you of today is uh, that computing is indispensable and uh, and of course there are many views on that and uh, some people have a, a, a totally different view on the computing, information and communication technology and where we are at right now. Uh, the view of some people is that we're actually not in a very comfortable state I, with regard to human-computer relations. Just out of a matter of interest, could you let me know um, who, who here considers themselves a computer or computing enthusiast? Throw up your hands. Okay, I suppose you wouldn't be here otherwise. The people who didn't put up their hands are probably just going to give you the hard time at the end uh, about why it's not um, a great area to be in. So I, I suppose I don't have to do much convincing there. Uh, but I, I will say, uh, and you, you probably have seen um, whether it's just in Queensland, nationally or internationally, that um, it depends on, on your area of work, study and play that, um, you know, computing, people have different perceptions of computing in their lives. If you are a person that just loves emailing, social networking and keeping in contact with your friends, well, it's, you're, it's an indispensable asset. Technology is just, without it, you would, uh, you'd certainly not uh, be able to survive on a daily basis. Um, you know, people have, I'll talk a little bit about um, iPhones and things and smartphones, but basically the concept of, of being able to be connected to some people now is totally indispensable. Um, whereas maybe if you're in a workplace where uh, computers are either taking over or computers, for example, have 
and started to do work in those e in those workplaces that sort of encroached into the human sphere. Um, well, some people may be quite disgruntled. Um, there's also the possibility that people may be disgruntled about computing uh, encroaching where they need to develop training in that area because, well, look at this stupid terminal sitting there. I have to use this now to get get to do my job better, and it's it's taking up time. It also sometimes take makes errors, and of course, it's not my fault. It's got to be the computer's fault when it comes to errors. So there there is um, sort of stigmas attached there, and and of course, some of you may have obviously lived through and, and understood the dot-com burst, which is where we went through a stage up to, you know, year 2000, 2001, where computing was, was you know, the favourite of everyone. People were investing in it, people were creating startup companies, businesses, all based on the concept that this was going to make us lots of money. And, uh, and of course, uh, you know, unfortunately, at about that time, uh, the burst occurred at the start of this century. And it actually created a, a big problem for some people. And it also influenced the way people thought of ICT, information and communication technology, computing, and said, you know, ooh, it's not really trustworthy, is it? Look at what happened. Uh, businesses went belly up. Uh, companies can't employ people anymore. Um, so, you know, pe that influenced what people wanted to study. That influenced what people were interested in, um, in terms of, uh, you know, jobs and, and future uh, aspirations. Um, so certainly that has had an impact. But we can't, there's one thing we can't say uh, at, this, at this stage, we cannot say that, we, that computers aren't everywhere, because they are. Um, in everything we, we do, we use, we, I mean, at this presentation, there's technology all around. Of course, without this laptop here, I can't communicate to you. But in, in everyday life, we, whether we carry them around in our pockets, or whether we interface with them at our workplaces or our homes, they are everywhere. And of course, what's really become exciting in the last few years is uh, the concept of the, the smartphones, the, you know, the iPhones, the mobile computing devices that enable us to go anywhere in the world, anywhere at any time, as long as there's good coverage of network. And we can pull out our uh, little device and we can really access anything about any uh, part of uh, you know, the information uh, that, that humanity has stored over periods of time, just at our fingertips. And, you know, this is really bad when you go to a trivia night these days because, you know, you, you, the, a normal human trivia night where you, get, where you answer questions is now totally saturated with people with, you know, clicking away at their mobile phones, Googling the answers. And so now we have to put our mobile phones at the front uh, of, of, the, of the event or, or have to turn them off because people now have this much access that, it, it's it's a information that there's just no possibility to hide that anymore because it's it's with us wherever we go, and of course there's the aspect of being able to communicate with our friends um, at any time of the day or night, and of course that can be quite irritating. So uh, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, the fact is that you you're at a table with your friends, having enjoying a lovely uh, lunch or dinner, and all of a sudden there's that person in the corner who just keeps checking their phone every few seconds and keeps emailing, SMSing. Has anyone experienced that problem before? The person in the corner that just won't engage in the conversation because there's obviously a far better conversation somewhere else in the world, in the cyberspace, than where they're at right now. Now, th this, this affects probably, this is an ailment that affects probably the younger generation, if I might be so bold, but it, but it actually is everywhere. Um, the, the concept of, of, you know, there has to be a party or an event that's much more interesting to where I am now. And what does that do in terms of our happiness with human interaction that we're supposed to have. I mean, we're supposed to be sitting at a table, enjoying a nice meal, the old school breaking bread with our friends, but there's always someone that can't hold the bread in two hands because they're too busy doing this all the time. So that, that is an interesting um, shift in the way people even interact face to face. Some people say, why do we even need to interact face to face? We've got computing there. We can just do it online. We can chat. We can speak. So um, that, that's quite interesting. But what's really uh, something that's uh, taken over in the last 10 years is the concept of crossing what I call the technology pain barrier. I talked about uh, people in, in the workplace, for example, who have been burdened by, for example, the use of uh, new automated equipment to make their jobs easier 
and of course um, not really responding to that well because obviously that involves training, it involves being able to uh, you know have to learn about this new technology, and of course technology, as I said, can make mistakes. But in reality now, um, most people are, are really getting quite comfortable with technology um, to the extent where they are basing their whole lives around the fact that you know they will have that mobile smartphone in their pockets and you know if I even though I'm in that meeting I can still respond to that person who's buying a product off me in the United States because I can just type that in whilst that person in the meeting's talking now imagine though if you know your your whole life and your whole situation is based on uh, the dependence on electronic mail and uh, and websites and and information that's digitally stored what would happen if if all of a sudden there was that power outage at the data center, or or that uh, cut in in the internet, you know that that no, you, you just don't have it for that period of time when you need it. It's interesting because in the old days people didn't worry about that. You know, uh, if they wrote a letter, it, they'd be lucky that it gets to to somewhere overseas in, in you know a month, two months time. Now we want that response straight away. We want you know, when I when you send an email, it's like whoa, hang on, this person I sent that yesterday. Why haven't I still got that response yet? It, it's almost like it's now a situation of, oh, they're, they're ignoring me, you know, because they didn't respond in 24 hours. And that we've gotten to a different sort of uh, habits when we deal in education and business and other ways that we interact. But certainly now it's almost like, well, I've got to check my email in the morning because or I've got to check my Facebook page just to make sure that that party went well the, the night before. So uh, I think the younger generation, they've got it. It's, it's now totally ubiquitous in their lives. But even now... We've got people uh, at, of all ages uh, getting into the concept of computing, social networking, and everything that offers without fear of it for the moment. So um, I'd just like to reflect on a little bit about the concept of, of uh, what the, the results of the bubble burst in, in the early part of the century had with regards to um, computing specialists in this country. Um, at the beginning of, of uh, this century, you, the, everyone was clamoring for jobs, you know, trying to rid out that, that world of that terrible disease, the Y2K bug. Do you all remember that? Okay. It, it, was, it was devastating. It really changed the way um, the world worked, didn't it? I mean, planes, you know, dropped from the skies and banks lost all, you know, accounts of every customer. You know, it's just a, a nightmare. But some people say, actually, look, let's not be sarcastic about this. Um, the reason that didn't happen, those tragedies didn't happen at the beginning of the century with the Y2K was because there were so many programmers and computer specialists on the job fixing the problems of companies. Um, and so that's why everything went smoothly. Um, so do you remember the hysteria of what people going to supermarkets and buying up canned goods, you know, just in case that the whole, I don't know, the supermarket the doors wouldn't open on the day they, w they wanted to go and, and purchase more products. Um, so people were just going really strange about that event. But yet that event actually ended up fizzling out and not being anything. But, you know, at that time there were a lot of people employed in the industry helping out. Um, after the uh, dot-com burst, um, we, we, were, we were in a situation where the interest sort of waned in that area and, and it all went back to schools, universities, and then it, it hit the industry where there are, there are so many job vacancies at the moment in the IT industry and there's a skill shortage that people don't seem to realise. You know, we don't have another crisis looming over the, over the shoulder there of the Y2K uh, variety, but we certainly do have the need to you know, maintain the level of technological advance that we have in this country and overseas. And so the, the concept of people actually working in those areas is extremely important. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a prospect that in 2020 you'll have 25,000 job vacancies that aren't filled yet because the skilled people aren't there for it. And, you know, there are some estimates um, that in the Asia-Pacific region worldwide, it could be in the millions that we actually have vacancies and new jobs created. Because as you know, you know, at the you know, around the next corner, there could be the next Facebook. We could have the next whatever it is that will will just revolutionise the way we uh, t keep searching base with people. And of course, you know, that's all part. At the moment, we're in the in the midst of the social networking revolution, where you know that's governing and, and uh, ruling people's lives at the moment is 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 to you know making sure that you know my Facebook page is up to date at the moment because otherwise you know. I'm, I'm, you know, I just want to know, want pe to tell people that I've just woken up this morning and it's a, it's a beautiful day. And people are posting these, you know, very interesting messages up there. But it, it's an in incredible uh, time where people are very interested in telling things about themselves, and they can do it at any time. You know, they can tweet, uh, you know, their, their current thoughts about anything. You know, 
Um, and it could be someone as famous as Charlie Sheen telling us about why he really hates the company that fired him for not being on his favourite show, or it can be just the person across the across the world that just wants to tell you that you know it's a beautiful morning in um, South Africa at the moment. So the, the the concept of of social networking is just blown out. I mean, we we are now in a in a, in a huge revolution there. It's taken us to a point where social networking is no longer in the in the state where we're just talking about friendship building or or telling our friends you know what we're doing at the moment. It's actually elevated the the concept to the point where we're talking about um, well actually we're talking about forming relationships that are that are not just friend relationships. It's now gone to the level of of course you know finding partners, marriage and love and of course other things that uh, may be more physical uh, than just love. And and the concept is that um, now the co the the interaction on the internet with someone going on you know dating on the internet or or putting up their profile on VIP. Does everyone RSVP? Sorry, does everyone know RSVP.com? Everyone heard of it before? No. The, 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 these sites are developed for you know bringing people together, um, but in a more romantic sense. And you know a long time ago, um, you know they would you would have been called the nerd if you would have been doing that. You know putting up your profile on this internet site, you know, trying to find love. I mean, goodness gracious, I mean, you know, can't you just go out to a bar and find someone or can't you, you know, meet someone in the workplace? Nowadays, that is not the case. I mean, we are now in a situation where uh, we're, we're finding a lot of people are actually finding true happiness and true love through, uh, through dating sites, ones that are probably more wholesome than others. Uh, and, and, you know, we've got that eHarmony site that's up there now, you know, that's advertised every time. Uh, you turn on the TV late night, you know, you, you'll find your perfect partner. Don't worry about finding them, just bumping into them on the street or, or in a social gathering. Why do you need a social gathering? Do it in the privacy of your own home and find your life partner there. But certainly that is where we're now in a situation that um, it's more accepted. There's no taboo with regard to that. So the concept of a digital romance and the possibility of uh, connections through the internet that uh, result in meaningful relationships is now totally accepted. So what, what's then the next phase in all this? You know, the next concept of, okay, most of the time you, what you do is you post little notes or you send emails or you communicate in that way. You've got a profile somewhere that shows that, you know, I'm, uh, you know, this is my photo. And of course, the photo was taken yesterday. It wasn't taken in an airbrush situation 10 years ago. You know, this, this is obviously my photo and, uh, and you're, you're, you're meeting people that way. Well, now there's a slightly different um, uh, shift. Now we've got actually more animated type ways of displaying yourself. Th now, the concept of an avatar is, uh, it means a lot of things to different people. Um, if you actually look up what an avatar is in the Hindu faith, it's a totally different concept. You know, it actually has religious connotations to the, to the sort of, uh, you know, prospects of the different uh, facets of a, of a god, for example. But it is actually uh, relates to what we in the digital age think of an avatar, which is a different facet of ourselves, perhaps. Um, it's, it's actually a, an extension of ourselves in, in a virtual sense. And, uh, and the, the concept of having a virtual being out there that may actually represent your views and maybe even your looks and your, even your thoughts, that's, that's something that's really becoming um, you know, very important at the moment in all sorts of aspects of, of life. And I'll talk a little bit about that soon. So, um, you know, there is here the prospect that we no longer have you know, the static page of here's my wall on Facebook with my static picture that I have to update it so often. What about if there's an animated being that is constantly out there um, trying to meet people even when you're asleep um, and, and, and talking like you to try and actually um, develop relationships, friendships and otherwise. So there's certainly this concept that avatars are moving into a situation where um, we, we're, you know, we're going to the next generation of social networking potentially, and some of you may already be, be using um, that, whether it be in, in games, um, whether it be in some other uh, setting, and I'll talk a little about some real settings of where avatars are being used. So, um, you know, at the moment, the concept of a virtual being is actually really taking off in business. Um, and I don't know if any of you have actually interacted with an, with an avatar already in a business setting 
But there are now a lot of businesses that say, okay, I would really like to make sure that I don't uh, employ more personnel to answer the phones about questions about, say, banking. Why do I need to do that when I can actually employ, in inverted commas, an avatar-like uh, being to actually talk to the customers um, online 24 hours a day without actually really employing a human. Um, now, that's actually becoming very common. Has anyone used uh, a, a, a chat bot or an avatar like that? Uh, yeah. So if, if you have, um, you, might, you might get a bit of a surprise, you know, because um, I'm with NAB and don't, you know, all, you know, throw tomatoes at me for that, but... But you know th that is a bank that is one of the Australian banks that's adopted a technology by a company called My Cyber Twin, okay, which is referred to down the bottom. And uh, My Cyber Twin, you can go to that website, and you know if you've got your wireless here now, you could probably even go to it right now. Um, but then you'd be ignoring me, so don't do that. Um, <laughs> but you know the the that that uh, is a spin-off company that actually was started by, and you know dare I say it an ex-Griffith University uh, graduate who, who actually had a spin-off company and now is doing extremely well in the United States. Um, and that company actually was, was one of the first to actually create these business avatar type uh, things. And, and on the NAB website, you've got this online assistant. The online assistant isn't to the point where it's animated yet and actually has a you know, real presence in a virtual sense that we're accustomed to in, say, gaming or other areas. But there's certainly the element of having intelligent chat and, um, and at the end of the day, you can either chat with someone through, you know, over the phone I I using your voice or you can just chat away in, in text. And the idea of this online assistant is that at any time you want a question about, say, internet banking, they will actually answer, uh, hopefully, your query. Now, there are some statistics that say that it's actually bringing more business, uh, you know, by about 60% more business to, to some companies. It's actually answering, you know, more, more percent than that of all queries in a satisfactory manner. Now, of course, I, I was very interested in using this. So, you know, I, I went online and I just said, you know, how are you feeling today, you know, as my question. And, of course, the answer was, can you please rephrase your question? You know, they, it's got no idea what I'm talking about. And, of course, I was under the impression I could probably ask this thing any question I wanted. But then there's the caveat that says, look, actually, I'm, I'm only about internet banking. Actually, I, that's all I think I can answer your questions about. So... I think there's a bit of what, what happens if you know. I mean, when when I get called up by a bank or a company, they usually will say, you know, how are you today? But but there, that, that's that's where maybe the pleasantries are now taken away when we deal with virtual beings. I mean, you, you can't just say how are you? You know what 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 you know what did you do yesterday? You know, there's, there's none of that. The pleasantry will be straight into, uh, you know, the actual conversation about the business. But the f the, f uh, the interesting thing is, it is actually increasing business to these uh, to these actual companies. So there's one aspect which is in the business area. Now in games, uh, you know, there's the whole concept of Second Life, and and there are other games where there are virtual worlds. You can actually purchase or have um, virtual beings that, that that are there, and they actually you know act on your behalf and do all sorts of uh, interactions with their environment in the virtual world. Um, and of course, there's there's as I mentioned already, I alluded to the concept of of the the love avatar. Um, on the My Cyber Twin website, you can actually go to these things called the perfect boyfriend or the perfect girlfriend, and you can have conversations with these uh, perfect beings um, in this in, in a probably which will probably result in a romantic way because I note that there's a an over 18 proviso on on that, um, but you you don't actually even have to um, talk to your own partner anymore. You can talk to someone. Is that is that online cheating? I don't know. I mean, this this is actually a, a being that's that's really being programmed by somebody. I think um, to to you know respond to you in a very positive and nice way. Um, and so uh, th this is this is you know is that is that really the future? Is that you know if we are sort of sick of our own partner, you know, I'm just, I've had enough of this person. I'm just going to talk to my virtual girlfriend, and you know, everything will be much better. So th that's there's some really interesting concepts there in regards to ethics and ethical conduct of oneself um, because does it really mean you are cheating? I mean, a lot of people say that if you're having a, a conversation with someone across the world um, who's a human, uh, well, you hope they are, and you're, you're, you know, you're, you're indulging in some sort of romantic discussion, that's cheating. But is it cheating if you're talking to a real virtual being that actually is not human? Is that called cheating? So 
what my cyber king calls their products, which are actually used in all these areas, business, gaming, and love, um, are avatars with brains. And they call them um, high IQ artificial intelligence. Now, this is where I, I sort of want to shift into a different gear uh, briefly and, and, uh, and talk a little bit about what it means to actually advance virtual beings um, as we know them in the future. Um, certainly, you know, it's easy to just program something. Um, so who's ever, I, I'm worried to answer this, uh, to ask this question, but who's, who's ever done computer programming before? Throw up your hands. Okay, good, some computer enthusiasts out there. For those of you who are not aware of, of what, what that is and, and, uh, and, you know, and don't really want to know, I won't go into detail about it, that's fine. But it's the concept of actually getting your computer through uh, very specific commands to do specific tasks. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but I promise not to bore you with it. Um, it it's the concept of actually saying, you, you behave in this way, okay? But in most cases, when you do that, it, it actually means the computer's still quite dumb and will not really perform in a way that seems quite intelligent. So when people start talking about high IQ AI, or artificial intelligence, that's really a different story altogether. We're talking about computers that do have brains to some extent and are actually able to interact with their human counterparts in a more intelligent way. So I, I, I promised that I wouldn't talk about this uh, for a long period of time, but I just wanted to show you the, the steps that will need to be taken to get a computer to do anything. So when you use your email and, or when you use any aspect of your computer that you know you, you uh, uh, make your life easier, um, in most cases that program uh, or that application has been programmed in a way that is just to do what it's supposed to do. Okay, just like when I asked that uh, NAB business financial advisor, "How are you today?" The parameters of that being was you know that question was totally out of its limits. It couldn't change or adapt in any way. To, I mean, e even if you go to someone like a teller at a bank, I mean, we know that maybe, you know, they, they don't have a fantastic personality, to, you know, but, but the point is you go up to the person and you, you, you try to make small talk, they probably will adapt out of their frame of mind of business and try to interact with you. But you know, a computer won't do that. They won't actually say, look, I, I actually understand that you're trying to divert the conversation into some other area. They'll just say, I'm just going to work how I've been told to work. And there's, it's very much a step-by-step -step process. You have to follow the steps in a very blind fashion without any uh, change or deviation. Well, you can't deviate, okay? It's just, that you, you, it's like a recipe. When you're reading a recipe in a cookbook, um, it won't just magically change uh, throughout the process that you're cooking. It'd be nice uh, if it could tell you even that, you know, well, you've had too much salt. But actually, you, you can't, it won't change. It's static. And it's just, that's the same with computer programs. So certainly, not intelligent. So what I'd like to... Um, talk a little bit of that on is the, the most important underpinning part of any virtual being or virtual beings or, or any type of uh, you know, avatars moving forward in the future. Uh, we've, seen, we've seen them, some of us have used them, and some of us have even controlled them. But one thing that we probably haven't seen enough of is getting these virtual beings or avatars or to actually do things that we think, wow, that's pretty intelligent. Um, and deviates outside of the norm of a computer. Now, who is um, of the age that can remember what that is? That, that, so, okay. So, <laughs> who doesn't know um, what the what HAL 9000 is? Well, that's good, because that means that um, you've spared yourself watching a very boring movie. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. No, I, I, I would just like to say that I, I actually love... Um, this movie, 2001 A Space Odyssey. And it's not from the perspective of, oh, you know, it's the, it's the most interesting film that I can sit through for you know, two and a half hours or however long it is. More so what concepts it talks about inside the movie. That is a visual of the eye that represents the HAL 9000. It's a, it's a, a computer that's on board a spaceship that ha can do things um, that no computer on, on Earth right now can do, even slightly. It can have conversations. It can uh, read lips. It can talk up to you about emotional aspects. It can play a game of chess. It can do anything um, apart from actually move about. So it's not a robot. It's just, it's just static. But it actually has this eye all over this spaceship in this movie. And it can, it can see everything. Hopefully, you know, not in the private quarters of this, you know, people that are on the spaceship. But the point is that Hal was, was touted at that time 
And this movie, if you recall, for those of you who recall, was, was made in 1968, right before you know, man landed on the moon. And the interesting thing was that um, it was so advanced. I mean, it was talking about advanced technology in 2001. And probably the authors, Arthur C. Clarke, who's, I think, one of the best science fiction writers of all time, sorry, was the best science fiction writer of all time, uh, probably you know, had in mind that you know, by 2001, I'm sure this will happen. You know, I'm sure there'll be a computer that can have a meaningful conversation and we won't even be able to tell the difference. But actually, 2001 has come and gone. 2010, which is the sequel to this movie, has come and gone. And we still, to this day, have not achieved what we would expect uh, to be the type of artificial intelligence that will, that will actually be close to even a human counterpart. So there's this whole concept of trying to pass what's called the Turing test. For those of you who are very computer enthusiasts um, in the audience, the Turing test is, is, was composed by a person called Alan Turing um, you know, about more than 50 years ago, which said, if you could put a computer in another room, you know, maybe closed off by a door, um, with no glass, you know, so and there's a human on the other end just chatting or sending notes under the door or just chatting through some sort of online method. And if the, the human could not tell that they were talking to a computer or a human, they couldn't tell the difference, then you've just passed the Turing test. Now, that, that goal was set, you know, over 60 years ago now. And, you know, believe it or not, that goal has not yet been solved. I mean, we, we, we haven't got to the point where we can talk to a computer in a, in a fashion that is very, you know, whether it be formal, colloquial, or just in normal conversation, without still being able to say, aha, I got you. It goes back to the whole, you know, internet banking thing. I can ask that thing a question about the weather, but it will not have a clue of what I'm talking about. But, th you know, th there's just something about the, the concept of our language and how we interact um, that has not even, we haven't been close to, you know, to solving that. So are we there yet? Well, certainly not if we go by the Turing test. And, and of course, this is really a very interesting thing because the technology that we're, we're aspiring to now, the concept of avatars, virtual worlds, there needs to be a real giant leap for it to get to a point where it actually meets the expectations of us as humans. So, um, look, I'm not going to give you a lesson in um, artificial intelligence much. No, I, I'm not going to give you a huge lesson. In it. I just want to touch on a point of interest, um, well, of my interest anyway. Um, hopefully it'll be of yours as well. What, what is artificial intelligence trying to do? What has it always tried to do? It's tried to actually say, look, w there, there are humans out there that are pretty much able to do some pretty amazing things. Why don't we use the biological inspiration from humans from the animal kingdom and let's try and replicate that in a computer. Now, again, you know, the first thing that ever was developed that was trying to mimic the human brain um, which is, was called a neural network, which is diagrammatically represented on the right-hand side. Don't worry about the detail. The point is that that, that first concept was, was actually put forward in 1943. Now, we're at a stage now where, where, where neural networks, which are you know, sit in the artificial intelligence class of, of well, suite of, of tools and technologies, has still not got to the point where it, it, does, it conducts miracles. There, there's no miracle uh, way to actually... Um, solve certain problems. It, it does do a few very interesting things. You can train a neural network, which is based on the neurons which are in our brain. Okay, So the concept of a neural network is talking about neurons that compose this network, and it's actually all based on our biological brain. Now, we've got 10 to the 11 uh, neurons in our brain. Okay, Now, that's a lot of connections. These are, these are connections of cells that conduct, send messages that allow me to move around, talk, and allow you to sit there patiently while, while I finish my presentation. So, you know, th this, this, these, e even that, even that posture of sitting, listening, there are millions of firing neurons in your brain. The concept was to try and replicate that into a machine through a very simplistic model of also firing and sending signals and trying to get the computer to think. The thing that it has achieved is enabled it to actually learn in a, in a, in a probably untraditional sense. It, is, it can actually learn from experience. It learns from things you give it. And, it, and hopefully gives you an educated decision at the end that may seem like it made an intelligent decision. So that's what a neural network is. And very, in, in a nutshell, it's something that can, can learn, sometimes in an unsupervised manner, but sometimes it needs help. But otherwise, it can actually provide answers to problems. I'm going to give you some examples very briefly of, of the problems that... that um, 
the technology of artificial intelligence has tackled and, and where we're up to there. And you might be able to ascertain for yourself whether we, we're at a stage of being able to really have our own avatars existing in virtual worlds to produce uh, meaningful results. So I'll, I'll just uh, say that you know, a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about in this very brief time is talking about the, the applications of artificial intelligence to things that really exist right now. Okay, these things uh, look pretty impressive. And if you look at what, what actually are the outcomes these days of some of these technologies, this actually exists right now and you can actually, in some cases, see them operating in the real world. So I, I'll start with, with one of my pet topics. Sorry there, Rory. Uh, which, is, which is handwriting recognition. Okay, now the concept of recognizing a person's handwriting is, is pretty much the same issue that we have in trying to have a computer converse with another human. It's such a difficult problem that it's, it's been, you know, people have been working on it for a hundred years and still haven't been able to get a computer to read handwriting in a way that we can. Can you identify every single one of those words? There's at least one I'm sure you have no idea about, even though you probably have the context of it. Um, you can see probably from the general context that these are all American cities or states. And, and, but you, one thing you, you don't know is, I'm sure one of those words at least, you can't read it. And, and even as humans, if we can't read it, how are we expecting our, our computers to do so? Well, if I just quickly go and, and, and show you just very quickly a, a representation of the letter A. Now, that may not look to you like the letter A, um, because that's not supposed to be human readable. That's more supposed to be something that a, a computer should be able to interpret. Now, this is the level of complexity that a computer has to um, have digested a letter A for it to understand what it is. So we're talking about you know, numbers. We're talking about you know, uh, the numbers actually represent things. They represent directions. So it actually learns, say, a character A by knowing what directions that this, this, you know, these, these lines are going in. So I, I need to have an understanding of the, of the shape of this character. I need to then take the shape and actually turn it into numbers that I can process, digest, which I call, well, I and other people in the community call features to actually digest so that I can learn the character A. That is a, that is a very quick representation of how complex it is for a machine just to learn that simple character. Now, I mentioned neural networks before. We're at the stage where cursive characters, that means characters out of words that are actually in running writing, can be recognized about 90% of the time. Now, 90% is actually about 5% more than a human can recognize cursive characters, believe it or not. So we've already got a s at a stage where there is one facet of computing that does, you know, uh, well, there's more than that probably, but so far that in my talk, there's one facet of computing that can be better than a human in terms of recognizing simple things like cursive characters. Um, there, we've, I've actually, there's other areas of handwriting recognition that are also being used at the moment where artificial intelligence is being applied to signature verification and detecting fraud. Um, and you know, there's a whole complexity in actually how that occurs. Um, you have to go to a process again of breaking down the signature of a, of a human into something machine readable and understandable. Um, we're at the stage where, you know, we, in, in, in the laboratory where, where I work at the university, we've got about 13.93% uh, um, error rate of, of actually being able to recognize forged signatures um, from handwritten material. Now, that's actually quite interesting to certain companies like credit card companies and people who deal with that on a, on a you know, quite a common uh, time, like, for example, legal aspects of, of document signing, um, because at the end of the day, there are a lot of forgeries. On the Gold Coast, just yesterday, there was uh, an uh, article in the paper of someone who'd, uh, who'd actually copied, would you believe, in a digital format, the signature of his wife from a note that she'd written for her child for school. Uh, she'd said, you know, little Johnny can't go to school today because he's sick. He'd actually taken that, digitized it, put it on a contract, a legal contract, and actually taken millions of dollars, including um, houses and, and property and, and uh, assets. Now, they had to get handwriting experts in to actually, you know, to check if this is a real forger or not. We're at the stage where we can actually get computers to do that. Um, another example, very quickly, I'll talk about something that's, you know, I'm, I am from the Gold Coast, so beaches, unlike here where beaches are sort of a little bit artificial, 
Um, we, we've got beaches on the Gold Coast, and there we've got actually cameras, believe it or not, already set up um, to look at um, the activities of, of people. Now, that sounds a bit big brotherish, I'm sure, to some people, but that, that is the reality that we've all up and down the coast, um, at, you know, of Queensland there, um, there, are, there are cameras set up for, for different purposes. Some people use the cameras to access uh, video to look at how the surf is on a particular day. But there are actually uh, techniques and technologies already available to be able to count people on the beach and actually be able to detect behaviour of people on the beach. Um, and I won't go through the detail of, of the actual processing, but it, it takes a bit of um, ability to get the, the techniques and technologies right. Again, you're you know, a human being on the beach. It needs to be you know, put into a situation where a computer can read that uh, and understand that shape. And again, we've, in, we've actually used neural networks for that. We, got, we get about an 85% accuracy to detect whether it's a human or a surfboard. Human or a dog. Human or a pile of sand that looks like a human. So we, we've actually got to the stage where the accuracy is pretty good at detecting people. We've also got the concept of being able to detect the behaviour of people. We've actually got the situation where we can actually detect whether a person is running, walking, milling, or just doing something that's a bit odd on the beach. Now, why would we do that? Well, it's actually not for the purpose of surveillance. It's actually for the purpose of safety. Um, the next step of this project is actually to work on technology that can actually detect people walking into the water and then being able to actually detect whether they are, in fact, in, in trouble, in hazard, and actually assist not, not get a computer to rescue, so a computer's not going to take off the cables and jump into the water. Um, it's actually to assist lifeguards and say, look, there is a potential problem there. Just in case you didn't see that, just check out this person here. They're waving their hands erratically. And that's, that's where we're, we're at with that. So you can actually, you may not be able to see it from the back there, but the little uh, boxes and rectangles there, we've actually already got the situation where we can detect a person um, on the beach and then actually ascribe to that person their behaviour, whether it's walking, running, milling, and we're now at the stage where we can say, can, does this behaviour, is, is this person entering the water? And the next stage will be, what is the behaviour of that person in the water? The last, a very quick real world application which I'll uh, talk about and, and we'll start winding down to, is the concept of using um, artificial intelligence for medicine. So people probably have heard of, of that. There's a lot of hype always in papers and, and, and in the media about technology that's available to help people. Um, in, in, from a medical sense. Um, some of the work that uh, we're undertaking uh, in collaboration with neurobiologists is to actually be able to use, would you believe this, a neural network, which is an artificial thing, to detect the differences in types of neurons in the human body. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, you'd want to do uh, detect different types of neurons in the brain um, to actually be able to dis discuss whether you can actually uh, detect differences in neuron function over time to see whether there's degradation in neurons. And why would we want to do that? It's so that we can maybe come back and, and try and combat um, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Because basically we, 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 we would love to know before it actually gets to a degraded state where you know, it's irreparable, whether there's a way to actually detect that uh, degradation and then, and then maybe curb it and potentially come up with a solution to assist with it. So there, there, is, there is that work which is quite interesting, but it's based on a very simple premise. Again, it's taking imagery of neurons in the human brain, for example, doing some sort of uh, you know, work on it uh, called heat extraction, and then using some sort of technology like a neural network to detect the difference between neurons and then try and then detect the, the changes of the neuron over time. So you, know, you start off with an image like that. I don't know if you can see it from the back there, but what you'll see is that there's, there's something a bit more prominent down the front there, a bulbous type uh, image, which is, which is the actual neuron in, in a brain. This is actually coming from a rat's brain, which will make you feel a bit more comfortable, or maybe not, maybe you love rats. Um, all the neurons around the filaments, there are other neurons interacting. So they're actually cutting into the image and actually distorting the image and making it quite difficult to read. To go through it and, and actually get a computer to isolate important parts of the image, you can actually isolate the neuron itself and actually get to a point where you can highlight it so that it stands out. We've gotten to a stage of about 91% accuracy in being able to detect the difference between different types of neurons, uh, specifically dopaminergic neurons, which is the ones that are, that are actually very commonly affected in ne neurodegeneration. And when we, did, when we got a human, an expert human in the lab to try and detect the difference between these neurons, um, they actually only got about 72% accuracy in actually detecting the difference between the neurons. So again, 
here's a facet of artificial intelligence that says, uh, I can actually outperform a human being. Now, all of these uh, applications I've showed you thus far should show that there is technology already in, in under research or already available that can actually contribute to the well-being of our community. It actually also can contribute to the safety and potentially to the medical well-being of, of people. So you could ask yourself the question, you know, well, all this uh, technology is available, does that contribute to our happiness in the longer term? Well, I think that this type of progress, I would argue, certainly does. So to just finish up here, I, I, I just want to talk a little bit about um, what, what it means to, to have clever computers in the future and you know, clever virtual beings. We, we certainly have missed a couple of things. We certainly have missed the concept of being able to you know, demonstrate competency in a number of areas. So all those things, great. There's a computer that can detect a neuron and, and, and a, a person on the beach, and then there's another one that can do handwriting. But could it all do the same? Could it all be one, one artificial being that does it all? Could it, could it all do things that would, would you know, help society? And, and well, the question at the moment, it ca they, they can't. There are computers for particular things or artificial intelligent beings for particular things that can do that can solve specific problems, um, but they can't do it all. So at the moment, we have to teach them as humans. We have to teach these artificial beings to do and solve certain problems. But um, learning from experience on their own, that's something they can't really do efficiently yet. Um, the, the, there's no concept of context and background knowledge. Okay, I mean, it'd be nice when I logged in um, and uh, to, to, my, to my National Australia Bank account, you know, that, that virtual being already greeted me with something like, how was the football game you attended yesterday? You know, that'd be really nice, but it, it doesn't happen. Um, there, there's no context or background knowledge in most artificial intelligent beings, and certainly there is no command, excellent command of the human, of human language. That's something that doesn't exist in computers yet. So the future of it, I, I see as, we, we will have systems and, and robotics that will certainly need to interact with the environment to actually go and, and actually do things for, their, for themselves, get information from the environment, and learn background and context on their own. That's something they can't do yet. The concept of digital flesh hybrids, we already see that. We already have people with bionic arms and implants that do certain things. That will become more prominent because to, to save people that are ill and to enhance people, um, unfortunately for things like, say, defense, um, there's already concepts out there to, to really move cyber, cybernetic implants to a, new, to a new level. Now, there's something that I, I didn't touch upon is the complexity of the human brain. Um, it's the most complex thing in the universe. That no one's been able to yet replicate that. Some people think that once they replicate its complexity at a full scale, we've, we've solved the problem of artificial intelligence. Well, that's yet to be seen, but that's something that will happen in the future. Now, the last thing, it's a, it's a final frontier, I think is actually being able to get computers to really be emotional and, and to think creatively. That's something that doesn't exist yet, and it would be the key aspect of virtual avatars in, in social networks. It, it'll be the key aspect of, of virtual love. If, if people really want to go down that path, and some of you may be cringing at that fact, uh, but others may say, hey, that sounds like a good idea, um, then the point is that you would have to have a computer that can ad adapt to the most complex aspect of human nature which is being emotional and creative so I'll end it there and uh, you can't see that very well but there's a link to uh, in, in uh, an article I recently wrote um, in the Griffith Review if you're interested in in reading the, the the background of what this presentation is based on feel free to visit that and uh, thank you very much for your attention Michael has very naughtily gone over his time by quite a way. Uh, we, we, we did start five minutes late, though, so we'll allow it to go through to about five past or something, unless I get the get the word from someone else. So, uh, uh, we've got a microphone. Are there any questions for Michael? Um, there must be a few from that. It was a very broad-ranging, very interesting subject matter. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, I was reading in a book by Gary Kasparov, the world chess champion, who, and uh, reflecting on his uh, experience playing against computers like Deep Blue, for example, uh, he noticed an interesting uh, flaw in the design of, uh, ch of strategy for the um, way that they, the computers play chess, which was to just use brute calculation. But the problem was that it, the computer couldn't understand time. It couldn't understand how 
sacrificing like a, a major piece like a queen, which looks stupid prima facie, um, can actually give you a lot more moves ahead and actually progress your game a lot further. Uh, is, has there been any progress on un getting computers to be more fuzzy and recognize externalities like that? It's, it's a very good question. And um, I don't know if you got from my presentation in general, um, I was actually putting, I was being the devil's advocate when it came to artificial intelligence. Um, although it's my primary research area personally, and I love that work because I, I can see so many applications and so many interesting aspects, that the reality is that um, we're at a stage that we haven't got to a point where these type of little nuances that we as humans you know, take for granted, the fact that we've got an insti a gut instinct to do something, or, or, or you know, I think that would be a good idea because I just have that from experience and I know that. It's something that computers still can't do to a level of, of satisfaction. Certainly there's work uh, done in, in an exact area of what you just mentioned, which is the concept of fuzzy logic. It's, cool, it's a branch of artificial intelligence, and, um, and some people think it's the be-all and end-all to actually uh, being able to solve those problems, but it, it isn't really. It's a stopgap until we find something better. The, the ability, and you know, I could imagine that when Kasparov ended that tournament, he would have been quite upset, um, but, but he shouldn't be, because at the end of the day, the, the level of computation that Deep Blue had to have um, was, was, you know, incredible. Um, the, the number of moves ahead no human could potentially have that because there was just so much memory devoted to it. But one thing it didn't have was the ability to have those gut instincts and that ability to make decisions which are slightly out of the ordinary, which humans would do to make strategic decisions. So we, I don't think we're at a level yet where that's been solved and it'll take some time before it does. Okay, we've got a question here. Um, this might be a bit of a tangent, but it's, it's um, to do with, with happiness and, and virtual worlds. So if I took a bit of a broad brush and said, okay, virtual world might be something like World of Warcraft, but also maybe even something like Facebook, because a lot of people sort of spend time in that. So I'm interested in happiness in terms of, you know, people's happiness in terms of like maybe being in that world and then being out of that world, and if you've got any comments on that. Certainly. Um, I've got a lot of comments about <laughs> social networking and, um, and the concept of, of people's immersion in those worlds. I, I mean, I, I, I personally think that um, we as humans really need human interaction sometimes on a more credible, real level, which is, you know, seeing a person across a table, um, whether it's on a candlelit dinner or I whether it's, uh, you know, just having a talk to someone, uh, you know, over a game of pool or something. Um, the point is that I believe that this immersion that some people are experiencing into virtual worlds to gain happiness, um, you know, it's venturing into the artificial in a sense. Um, you're still talking to people at the moment. When, when, you talk, when you're doing Facebook, you're still talking to people. But most of the time you're not because that person may be sleeping and you're just interacting with what they left, a message or something else. Um, and so if, if your life revolves around the concept of um, you know interacting through a computer to, to talk to other people, um, I think that there's a, you're, you're missing a lot of the real interaction with a human being. And so certainly you can gain happiness from there. And some people find, some people are just not comfortable in large groups of people. And they'd rather be texting to their friends or, you know, whilst there's a, something else happening in front of them because they actually find it difficult to interact. So if, if, you, if you find happiness in that, that's fine. But I, I personally can't see how that can be your whole world. It can be part of your world and you can immerse yourself in that for some time and it can give you some happiness, but there's happiness elsewhere that people should be experiencing. <laughs> you know, and that is very common, and, and it's very scary, actually, because <laughs> they should all be enjoying a beer or even a soft drink. But <laughs> Mic drop here. Hi. Um, you talked about RPC clock and um, HAL 9000 and how that kind of represented a future for artificial intelligence. I wanted to ask you about a different science fiction writer's perspective, uh, which is Douglas Adams um, had a very offbeat uh, view of it. Um, do you think that it's possible to attain that sort of emotional intelligence in computers without ending up with 
creatures like Marvin the Paranoid Android and <laughs> elevators <laughs> who are afraid to go up because they can see slightly forward into the future? Yeah, um, I think it's a, it's a very good question, and I think it also um, touches on other aspects, which is, um, you know, y you've got uh, Marvin the Paranoid Android and you've got um, Hal the Psychopathic Killer, ro you know, computer. Um, you, you start getting to, I think there's this, there's this certain innate fear in people that we'll, we'll reach a, a certain point where we're creating robots that can create robots, like in the movie I, Robot, or something else, um, th where, you know, um, the deficiencies of artificial beings will then, s you know, either stop them from achieving their, their you know, goals of, of, of self-exploration and self-awareness, and or at the same time become erratic and actually dangerous, um, you know. And I, I think um, at this stage, with the technology that's available right now, we, we are not going to see emotional beings, robots, virtual avatars, anything else that, that will really um, give, give us as humans the satisfaction of saying, wow, we created that, that and we can't tell the difference between ourselves and that, and that being. Th there are certain blockages now that we, we can't get past. We're waiting for the next big thing, the next big revolution in artificial intelligence research. There was a, a, um, a conference at MIT recently by some of the founding fathers of artificial intelligence research, and they said that um, artificial intelligence research needs a reboot. Now, we see that um, there are reboot in, in movies. You know, Batman's been rebooted and Spider-Man's been rebooted. All, you know, all these great movies have come up with new versions that will hopefully appeal to a new generation. One thing we need to do in AI is actually take a good look at the principles that occurred in the old days, which is how do we set out to solve this problem of getting you know, computers that are like humans? And what have we done wrong that's taken us so long and diverted us off path? You know? We've solved little problems, but we've, we've now lost the, the big view of actually coming up with a solution of an emotional computer, something that's, that's as close to us as we can possibly get. And there's certainly impediments with that now. Um, I've got a speech problem. I have to whisper. Um, you ever talk, think about avatars that you know work while you're speaking, like to meet people, for instance? Is there anything being developed where, you know, like say I'm talking to, well, my avatar's talking to a guy, and he says certain keywords that just totally put me off, <laughs> and then can my avatar respond in a way that I would res respond or want to respond? There is um, technology available now through my cyber twin, that, that website that I was mentioning, where you could actually have, and it was, you know, uh, in those days when I looked at it last, it was actually interfacing with MSN Messenger, you know, a chat, where it would actually learn from you chatting to people when you're still awake to actually learn your unique idiosyncrasies and, and potential ways of speaking and interests and store them in a database, intelligent one, um, that could actually, you know, mimic you, hopefully, when you are sleeping and offline, but your avatar's online. And so the ability then for the avatar to speak to, say, a person overseas that's awake in the United States and say things that you would say, um, detecting the nuances of what the other person is saying and then trying to, uh, you know, uh, respond based on that is still a little bit further away. But it is the technology being developed right now that's trying to ascertain that exactly. Because what that's referring to is a dynamic interaction where the computer can actually, you know, bring in, take the information that we know of that you like to talk about and that you uh, like uh, in, in, a, in a conversation and then try to take that and then interpret what the other person's saying and then, you know, learn from that um, almost dynamically and respond back. And certainly um, I'm aware that, I mean, there's many technologies like my cyber twin. I have to say that, sorry. But it's not just that one. But I just highlighted on that one because I, I know it well and, and it's done some pretty amazing things. There's certainly technology that's going down that direction. Yeah. And, and you never know, there could be two virtual people talking to each other when they're both asleep. It's a frightening concept. Uh, Margaret, last question, I think. Yes, Thank you. It's a very interesting subject. I'm just wondering, um, in conclusion, sort of, do we actually, as humans, need artificial intelligence whether it makes us happy or not? That's a very good question. It's a very brief and a very good question. <laughs> I, I think, um, you know, this talk was supposed to uh, just highlight a bit of a journey, you know, um, 
you know, here's what the main conversation is around virtual beings and how at the moment there are actually people being made happy by social networks interacting with virtual beings. And I, and I went on the tangent and to discuss different types of artificial intelligence that underpin. So the sort of things I talked about were underpin the technology that enables that to happen. Um, you know, I, I alluded to the fact that, you know, we, we can't always think of, um, you know, artificial things, whether it be computing, robots or other things, as any substitute for human interaction. In fact, some people are using the concept of computer interaction um, as, as the, the way to replace human face-to-face -face interaction. And some people love that. And um, we're, we're probably going into a stage now where the new generation that's coming in is, is actually finding that as normal. So, um, and now the technology is getting to a stage where it really needs artificial intelligence to develop further. So if, if we're saying that the new generation loves this stuff and would really like to continue on and wants to explore the boundaries of it, then artificial intelligence is essential for that to happen, and it's already happening. And, uh, and therefore, we just, we just keep moving on. We're going to keep moving on to the stage where people are going to be on their phones rather than talking to their human friends. And uh, I personally think that that can be a part of your life to make you happy, but it shouldn't be the only part of your life that makes you happy. Um, but I, I have another argument for artificial intelligence, and that is that artificial intelligence can actually be used in other areas, not just for social networking and making you happy in the more visible sense. I'm thinking of computer systems that can um, s you know, allow your letters that you want to write to your grandma in Alabama to get there quicker. Happy birthday, grandma. That, that, that technology is already out there and being developed that can ensure postal sorting is, is faster, more efficient, and it can communicate you know, to people that are far off uh, in far off places. So that's happiness there. Um, you, can, you can save people from drowning. You know, um, that, that's, that's not an immediate source of happiness, I suppose, uh, that you think of every day, but going to the beach for some people is a, is a daily event. And the, the, the satisfaction that you can have in a, in a s piece of software that can save you um, if you get into danger, certainly we should make you know, mums and dads of their children who go surfing happy. And then the last thing is, artificial intelligence being used in medical applications. Um, if we can make technology uh, you know, help our people live longer and experience better care in the health department, then certainly um, that should make us happy. So virtual worlds, virtual reality, and social networking is one aspect of happiness that, un sorry, I about to say unfortunately, <laughs> that, that fortunately is making a lot of people really happy. But it shouldn't be the only one. There are other aspects of life where technology and artificial intelligence can work but even take out all that artificial intelligence, if I go out with Rory after this for a cup of coffee and we talk about the experience we've had today, I would much prefer that than doing it over a chat. Absolutely. Uh, we're out of time, everybody. Would you join me in thanking Michael for his talk today? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much.